carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Or oh, we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our rest. <laughs> Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Good singing, you may be seated. certainly appreciate that and I hate to say it but you'll have to take your coats off now I know what a drag yes unsanctioned HCS coats uh, if you could please take them off thank you thank you even if you're about to solve a mystery later and you need a trench coat that's how that goes all right so very thankful to have uh, my good friend uh, uh, brother James Pranger and uh, very excited uh, for uh, his future. His lovely family is here as well, so make sure you say hi to them at the end of chapel. And uh, just has become a good friend to me over the years. Uh, last year for our missions conference, uh, we were putting together a maze uh, for like a children's attraction for the, uh, the missions aspect. And actually, we had brought in our Bible class, if I recall correctly, and uh, they helped too. Ethan was a big help with that too, if I remember. And uh, But Brother James uh, helped uh, put pretty much him and Brother Rich Foreman, the whole thing together. And I, I was left like holding a hammer, you know, just praying that I don't actually hit my head with it. And uh, so they did a great job. And he's just one of those guys where you can always rely on. And uh, just uh, at any, really any time of the day, I, if, I, if I need him for anything, I'm like, hey, can you help me with this? He's always around. So, so he's just a, a, been a faithful friend. I'm very excited for what the Lord has for him uh, coming up here uh, in the next couple months. So make sure you say hello to him afterwards. And, uh, but beyond that, he is a phenomenal preacher of God's Word. So have your notes ready, have your Bibles ready, and let's give a good hearty welcome to Brother James Pranger. All right. Well, good morning. I'm uh, thankful for the opportunity to preach this morning to you, and I uh, hope it will be a blessing and encouragement to you. And as Brother Sam said, uh, there's some changes going on in our lives and our ministry. And uh, those of you that don't know, here in the not too distant future, our family is going to be moving to Alaska. And the Lord has led us there. I'll be looking at taking a pastorate there, transitioning into that position starting in June and then going from there into November, actually becoming the pastor of Mana Baptist Church in Palmer, Alaska. And so this uh, very well could be one of the last times I preached chapel in a long time here at Heritage. And uh, unfortunate, right? Uh, some of you guys are like, man, I hope you just shut up and sit down. But, uh, um, but I'm thankful for the opportunity. And I'm, I hope, like I said, I hope and pray it will be a blessing to you and encouragement to you. I know the school year is getting uh, really close to being done. And probably most of you are really excited about that. Uh, probably you seniors, how many more weeks do you have to a senior trip? Uh, two, two, three weeks? No one knows. No one cares, right? <laughs> Just joking. Two weeks. All right. You know, I remember when uh, I was a senior here at Heritage, and it always seemed like as soon if you could just make it to the senior trip. After that is just coasting, nothing really else going on beyond the senior trip. And so I know many of you, that's kind of the way you're looking at that. But I would uh, encourage you to finish strong, finish well with that. But uh, I know you have a lot of different uh, life changes, a lot of different uh, things that will be taking place here in the coming months, and it's an exciting time. But I also encourage you that just because it's exciting and there's a lot of change going on, don't neglect your relationship with the Lord. Above all things, seek that relationship with the Lord. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like to ask you to turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And we're going to be looking at a portion of Scripture here in chapter 1. And it really talks about the ministry of the Apostle Paul. 
And the Apostle Paul, as he ministered that, uh, if you've read through your Bible, and no doubt many of you have, and many of you have been under preaching, a significant port amount of preaching, that you would know probably that the primary ministry of the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Gentile world. That uh, he preached throughout, all throughout Macedonia and Achaia and different regions, and that was the calling that God had placed upon his life. And so one of those churches or one of those areas that the Apostle Paul had preached to was Thessalonica. And uh, Thessalonica that we'll see here in this passage in just a moment when we read it, that uh, there was something that was incredible about this church. That as the Apostle Paul had gone to them and preached the gospel to them, that they had responded very well to the preaching of the gospel uh, of the Apostle Paul, and that as a result of that, it drastically changed their lives, and it led them then to live a life that was drastically different from what it had been prior. And so this morning, for the next little bit, uh, I'd like to preach to you specifically out of this passage, and if I were to give the message this morning a title, it would be this, The Power of the Gospel. The power of the gospel. So if you found your place there in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, look down in verse number 5. Verse number 5 of chapter 1, it says this, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. We'll ask the Lord's blessing upon this time in his word. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, just for this time we have together. Lord, that although this time uh, to some may seem long, to some may seem short, but Father, I pray that you would use this time, Lord, that as you've burdened my heart with this message to preach this morning, Father, that you would guide my thoughts and my words to, to speak what you'd have me to say. And Father, I pray that each individual here this morning, Lord, that although I know it's not necessarily by their choice they're here, but Father, I pray that they would listen attentively and Father, that they would open their hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to have free reign in their lives this morning. And that you would bring conviction where needed and encouragement where needed. Father, that each individual this morning would be challenged to live for you. And Father, we'll be sure to give you the honor and glory for whatever it is you choose to do in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I look in this passage and I think about the work and the ministry of the Apostle Paul... Uh, I think one of the words that would uh, come to mind as I look in this passage would be this, something of authority. Uh, or uh, another way you could uh, say authority would be power. You know, power and authority in a lot of ways are synonymous of each other. Someone that has authority is no doubt going to be a more powerful individual. Or someone that has power would be someone that would be of authority. And uh, oftentimes, though, power is something that Many desire, yet uh, many don't attain that. And uh, even though that power is something that many desire, oftentimes, though, people do attain that power. Yet, unfortunately, the people that do attain power, they don't know how to properly manage that power. They don't know how to properly manage the authority that they attain or the authority that is placed upon them or given to them. I'll give this as an example because no doubt authority and power can be used in a very effective way or it can also be used in a very derogatory way or a way that would be what we would refer to as an abuse of power. Uh, I think all of us would, could 
come up with an examples of those that we would look up to and say, no doubt they are a, a figure of authority and of power that we can look up to and say, I honor and respect that individual for who they are and how they carry themselves and how they administer the power and authority that they have. And I'm going to give an example this morning. And uh, as I was uh, preparing this and looking up this, I found out that maybe this isn't necessarily a completely true statement. It's more of like a, a hearsay statement about the individual named Joseph Stalin. Uh, most of you, I would hope, would know who that is, Joseph Stalin. He was the, the ruler of the country of Russia during World War II. And if you look back and think back about the history of Russia, that uh, throughout Russia, especially in the, during the World War, II, uh, World War I and leading up to that, uh, their, their leader was Lenin. Vladimir Lenin was a very brutal individual that many, many people died as a result of the ruling and the reigning of Vladimir Lenin. However, if you were to look at history, there was one person that was even more brutal than, uh, than uh, I believe, than Lenin. It was this. It was Joseph Stalin. Millions of people died at the hands or under the authority and the leadership of Joseph Stalin. And there's this, there's this saying or there's this story that is uh, attributed to Joseph Stalin. And it goes something along the lines as this, dealing with authority. Supposedly at some point Joseph Stalin had called in some spectators and called in some reporters into, into, an, office where, into an office building where he was at. And he began to instruct them and, and share with them about how much he has authority and power over those that uh, were under him. And the story goes on to say that he, began, he took a chicken and began to pluck every single feather off of that chicken that was still alive. Now, if someone were to take your hair and begin to pull your hair out, it would probably hurt. And no doubt it hurts a chicken when you pluck the feathers off of it. And, if he, and the story goes that he took that chicken and he plucked every single feather off of it. So no doubt there was some blood that was then uh, coming from the body of that chicken. Yet that chicken was still alive. And he said, listen, this is my power that I can do this. I can pull every single feather off of this chicken. Yet then he reached into his pocket and he grabbed a crumb of food. And he gave that chicken a crumb of food. And that chicken ate that crumb of food. And he took a few steps over and he pulled out another crumb of food and he put it on the ground and the chicken followed him. And so as he walked around the room, he would put a crumb of food. And so that the person that inflicted much pain and much agony to that chicken now is giving him just a crumb of food and causing that chicken to follow him. Would you not agree with me this morning that that is a very clear demonstration of abuse of power and authority that you have? That you can do that to an individual and physically force yourself upon them and create this agony, this painful situation in that individual's life, yet still give them just a little piece of something to get them to follow you. No doubt that is a very clear picture of, of abusive power. Now you probably think to yourself, how does that really relate to this passage that we've already read this morning? See, because as we look in this passage, that uh, the Apostle Paul, he's going to demonstrate the power that has been given to him by God Almighty, the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we can look back and you can read Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. And I'm sure most of you, you have this, this verse memorized when the Bible says, And ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Throughout the world. And so what he's saying is, listen, that the Apostle Paul, as God had commissioned the Apostle Paul to go about and go to the regions beyond and to preach the gospel, that, there, that, that what enabled him to do that, the calling that had been placed upon his life to do that, came directly from God and that God had given him power. And as a result of that power, he was to carry the gospel to the regions beyond, not just in Jerusalem and the regions beyond Jerusalem, but regions all the way out through Macedonia, where the Gentiles were at. He had been given power to carry the gospel to them. And, the re and so therefore, because we see that it's a biblical precedent, that the individual that goes and carries the gospel to uh, people, the only way he can do that is directly as a result of the power that has been given to him by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And so here in chapter one, the Apostle Paul is giving testimony as he's writing to this group of Christians that he had the opportunity to preach the gospel to. He had seen them uh, saved and then this church formed. And so he's writing this epistle back to them to encourage them, say, listen, the result of the power of God leading me to you to preach the gospel, the result of that power, look at what it has brought forth in your lives, in your midst there in Thessalonica. And so picking up in verse number five, notice what he says. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. Now I want to I want to bring out to you what he's saying when he says our gospel. He's not saying his message. He's saying the message that God had burned in his heart and and had commissioned him to carry to these people. He's saying, listen, that our gospel, that as this was a part of us, that it was a part of our life, that as we carried this gospel to you, it came not only in word only. What he means by that is this is, listen, that simple words, they don't really mean much. That I can stand up here and I could just uh, be saying and spewing off a bunch of different words, but unless those words are formed into sentences and formed into a very clear, concise thought or a thought process to lead you to something, it would be pointless. You know, other than a few people here this morning that, that, that speak Russian or understand Russian, if I began speaking to you in Russian this morning, you wouldn't understand a single thing. And so it's important the Apostle Paul is noting in verse number five, he says, listen, that as we brought the gospel to you, it wasn't just a bunch of words or even it wasn't just a bunch of thoughts that we had relayed to you. But there is something very important in this gospel message that as we brought it to you, there was a working that took place in your hearts and lives as a result of hearing these words. And notice what that working was. It says this, but it came not only in word, but also in Power, meaning as the Apostle Paul came and delivered the gospel message to them, there was a certain element of power or authority that was there that as the Apostle Paul shared with them and preached to these people, that he had the authority to stand on to deliver this message to them. And notice directly how this power then is related to the Holy Ghost. And it says, it wasn't also in power, but was also in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as we know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. He's saying, listen, that as we brought this gospel message to you, you are well aware of the power of the Holy Ghost that was upon our lives and upon us as we delivered this message to you so that as you would hear this message, that you would respond accordingly. That uh, it wasn't necessarily anything that we did, but it was the power of God working in and through us as we preached and as we spoke. But notice in verse number five, he says this, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. He's saying first, he says, you were followers of us, that you begin to imitate us, that as, as we were directing you to live according to a specific uh, standard, if I could say that, but he says, listen, that as we were the example for you, that you begin to follow us and live in accordance to obedience to us as we were being directed by God to instruct you in likewise manner. But it wasn't just that you were following us and, and, living, uh, and, and, and uh, living according to these things, but imitating their manner of living. But he says that they became ultimately what? Followers of the Lord. See, if you were to look at leadership as a whole, and I remember when I was in Bible college that we, we had a specific class in Bible college. It was called this biblical leadership. And one of the things they taught us in biblical leadership was really, if you were to summarize the entire semester up, that if you did not learn this one thing, then you would automatically fail the class. It's this, is that biblical leadership is this, is moving others to God's agenda. Not causing people to align up to your agenda or to your way or the way you'd have things to go. But it is moving and leading people so that they in their hearts and lives, they are in tune with God. So that they then can live in accordance to the way God would have them to live. Not necessarily the way I would have them to live. Because I am a human I can sin, I have my flesh, and there are times that maybe for selfish reasons that I may try to get someone to do something. 
Yet maybe that wouldn't necessarily align with what God would have them to do. And so therefore it's important then as a, as, as a leader, as a God-called uh, leader, it's important then to move people onto God's agenda and to direct them to do what God would have them to do rather than what we would want them to do. And so the Apostle Paul in verse number six, he's giving testimony. This is, listen, not only are you a follower of me, not only are you followers of us and aligning with us and, and communicating, communing with us in this way, but you are ultimately a follower of God. And no doubt as a biblical leader, nothing would bring someone greater joy than to know this, that the individuals that you are seeking to minister to, that they are in tune with God and that they are following after God and not just my own philosophy, not just my own way of doing things, but they are in tune with God and they are following God. There would be no greater joy than to know that. And the Apostle Paul is giving testimony of this very thing. And he says this, that as you have received the word in much affliction. See, one of the, uh, one of the evidences of the fact that these Christians, that they had truly become Christians was this. That they were willing to become Christians in spite of the affliction and the persecution that they knew that they would face as a result of converting to Christianity. Now, I know for us living in America, it's hard for us sometimes to imagine that to become a Christian, that you would actually have to give up something. That to become a, a Christ follower and to give your life wholly and completely to God and say, God, my life is yours. Use it as you see fit. God, I am trusting only you. I am trusting in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross and nothing else. And it's hard for us as Americans sometimes to envision or imagine that for someone to believe that or come to that conclusion and to truly receive that and believe that, that there could really ever be any persecution or repercussions. But can I tell you, there's a lot of places in the world that we live in that even today, that the moment a, an individual makes the decision to follow after Christ and to tr trust Christ as their Lord and Savior, immediately they know that they are bringing upon themselves elements of trials and persecutions. See, there's, there's a lot of different countries, even some of the former Soviet Union republics, where now they are primarily uh, Islamic countries. They're uh, more ruled by uh, Sharia law rather than uh, just the rule of the law. And as a result of that, they have the laws on books that are anti-conversion laws. That it is absolutely against the law for one individual to convert someone from Islam over to Christianity is absolutely against the law. And so the individuals, no doubt, that go out and they preach the gospel and they share the gospel with, with those that would be consider themselves Muslims, that at that moment they understand that they very well could face persecution or even prosecution for doing what they're doing. But also within those cultures, there's those that they know they belong within a staunch Muslim family that if they were to ever convert to Christianity, that their brothers, their sisters, their mothers and their fathers and their grandparents would absolutely 100% abandon them and have nothing to do with them for the rest of their lives. They would literally kick him out on the streets and they'd be left fended to themselves. Even if they were only 12, 13, and 14 years old, they would be kicked out of the house for converting to Christianity, accepting Christ as their Savior. So let me ask you this question. Knowing the brevity of the situation, understanding that if they received Christ, that they would face these consequences. Wouldn't you say then that the individual, that knowing the consequences of receiving Christ, that very well they could be, uh, then, the, the, then they could be uh, receiving to themselves much persecution? Yet them making the decision to follow after Christ. Would you not agree with me this morning that that right there would be a very clear cut evidence proof that they are truly regenerate? that they're willing to sacrifice everything in their life for the joy and the truth in knowing that one day I will spend an eternity with Christ. 
And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, that I understand and I recognize that in the midst of your circles that you, you face these things and you knew quite well that you would face these persecutions if you accepted Christ. Yet in spite of all those things, you said it is worth it. Because you understood that the sufferings of this present world, this present time, they are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That no matter what we may face on this earth, it is absolutely nothing than having the assurance of knowing that one day I will spend an eternity with God. Forever. And ever. And no matter what I may face... It's not worthy to be compared with those things which lie ahead as a result of having that assurance of salvation. And it says not just in much affliction, but notice what, come, what came as a result of having that assurance. It says with joy of the Holy Ghost. No doubt he is talking to a group of people that it wasn't just a facade. It wasn't just something that they had done to put on a show in front of people, but this was something they knew that as a result of them coming to Christ, there would be real, uh, real situations in their life that they would not like because of them coming to Christ. Yet they said, it's worth it. Christ is worth it. Salvation is worth it. And so they said that they had this joy that came as a result of the Holy Ghost indwelling them, knowing that their eternal destiny is secure. And notice in verse number seven, he says this, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So he's just laid the groundwork and said, listen, this is the evidence of the fact that I know that you are born again, that you've received Christ, that your lives have been changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's become so much evident that you are changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says that you are now in samples or examples to those that would that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Meaning that the testimony of these Christians, the testimony of this church here in Thessalonica, it was such that the regions beyond Thessalonica, they would see them and they would see their consistency. They would see their steadfastness. They would see their faithfulness to God in spite of all these afflictions and persecutions that they were facing. It says, listen, that you are an example to these other Christians of how a Christian ought to live in the midst of everything else. You are that example. You are that example. That everywhere as I've traveled, as I've gone about noticing number, verse number eight, it says, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but, in, but also in every place, your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. You know what he's saying is, is this, is that I, the Apostle Paul, and those that have been traveling with me, as God has charged us and, and led us to go to these different regions and to preach the gospel, there's one thing that we're continuing to hear over and over and over again. It is the faith and the faithfulness of the Christians there in Thessalonica. How they have been faithful to do what God has commanded them to do. They've been faithful to live a life of examples of the way a Christian ought to live. He's saying that from Macedonia and Achaia and all these other regions, that your faith to God word is spread abroad. See, these regions that no doubt there were people within this church that they were more of a business nature, that as they would go about and traveling from city to city, uh, doing whatever nature of business that they had, that one of the things that they would take with them was this. They would take the gospel message with them. That they would share the gospel in the regions beyond that as they traveled and as they went about, they would take the gospel to those places. You know what's the biggest difference between that and so many times Christianity today? It's this, that we can look at church and we can go to church and say, I'm in church, I sit in church, I'm a Christian, I'm living the way God would have me to live because I go to church on, on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and I go to church on a Wednesday. But the moment that I leave the doors of the church, I live however I want to. But see, that's not the case about this church here. 
That when they would come together, sure, they would come together and they would fellowship and they would be preaching and they would be encouraged and challenged as a result of the preaching and the teaching of God's word. But let me let me assure you that the moment they stepped out the back doors of the church or the house, wherever they were meeting at this, they understood that they walked out those doors. And the moment they walked out those doors, they were entering in to the mission field. You know, many churches that we've had the privilege of going to and I've had the privilege to preach in that oftentimes in the back doors of the church as people are leaving, sometimes churches will have a sign right above the back doors that says this, you are now entering the mission field. And that is to remind the people that, listen, just because you come to church, it doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a good Christ follower. But when you go out those doors, you have a responsibility as a Christian to take forth the gospel so that others would hear the gospel and that they can be saved too, just as you've been saved. And just as you have that assurance of salvation and you have that assurance of your, that your eternity is secure in Christ, they too can have that, that, they too can have that assurance of knowing they're secure. Their eternal security is secure in Christ. So he's saying, listen, that you as a church, not only was it the real deal in the midst, not, not only did you demonstrate that you were serious in this, by in the midst of persecution still being willing to trust Christ. But once again, you demonstrated your sincerity by then as you went about throughout your cities, throughout your towns, and as you went about to the regions beyond, you shared your faith. So much so that as we travel about, one thing we continue to hear over and over and over again, those Christians in Thessalonica, they're the real deal. They got it. In essence, I kind of get this picture that as the Apostle Paul would travel and he'd go to these towns and he would meet Christians in those towns. In essence, he would ask them, how are you a Christian? How did you hear about Christ? Well, there was so-and-so from Thessalonica. He had come, he was here doing business, and he had shared with me how I can know for sure that heaven is my home when I die. And he had shared that with me and I believed it and I trusted Christ and because of that I'm saved. And everywhere the Apostle Paul went in this region, he says, I hear continually about the faith that you folks have in Thessalonica. Now I want to remind you this this morning. These are people that the Apostle Paul, he himself had reached with the gospel. He had preached to them. They had responded to the gospel directly as a result of the Apostle Paul preaching to them. But I want to point out to you that the authority that the Apostle Paul, as he preached the gospel to them, it wasn't here aligned with these specific things. Do this. It wasn't that the Apostle Paul was shoving him into a box and saying, listen, you have to stay within this box. You do exactly as I say you need to do so that I will look good in front of everyone else. You do all these things just so that you will align with the way I think you ought to align. No, what the Apostle Paul did that as he went to Thessalonica initially to preach the gospel, as the Holy Spirit spoke through them, it was this, is He was teaching them, listen, these are the important aspects that you need to learn. That as you learn these things and as you develop this relationship with God and have this communion and fellowship with him, that he will then guide you how you ought to live. He will then guide you how you you ought to take forth the gospel message to those around you. Not doing what I'm telling you to do, but listen, that, that you would be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your lives and that you would live accordingly. So his authority that he had over them wasn't to shove them down and put his foot on their necks and say, you listen to me and you obey me. But listen, it was this, is pointing them to do what God would have them to do. Leading them and directing them to God's agenda, not the Apostle Paul's agenda. And why is that so important? Notice as we continue on to verse number eight. I'm sorry, verse number nine. For they themselves... Show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's saying, listen, the evidence of the fact that we came, we preached the gospel to you and that God changed your life is this. 
those inanimate objects, objects, those little wooden statues, those little rocks that you used to bow down to and you used to worship and think they meant something to you, you understood that they mean absolutely nothing. And that you turn from those and you begin to worship the one true living God. But not just that you worshiped God. Notice what it says there at the end of verse 9. It says that you turn to God from idols. Notice what it says. To serve the living and true God. The evidence of the fact that they had received the gospel and what they got was legit. And as a result of the apostle Paul directing them and his authority and his power, leading them onto God's agenda was this, that they in turn, they served God. See, that's what a true Christian is. It's not just someone that believes in God and says, I believe in God and I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I have my eternity secure. It's not just that individual, but a true Christian is saying, listen, because of what God has done for me, I'm going to live in light of that fact. I'm going to serve God with my life. My life is no longer my own. It is yours, God. I'm going to live for you in the way you see fit. See, because this, because when they had been saved and their lives had been transformed, they were moved to live lives that were passionate for Christ because they knew that one day, as it says in verse number 10, one day he's coming back. One day he's coming back. So if I could summarize this entire passage up into this, it'd be this, that the evidence of a life changed by the gospel is a life that lives out their faith and has a passion to share the hope that he has in Jesus. Let me once again state that. If you were to summarize this up, it'd be this, that the evidence of a life changed by the gospel is a life that lives out their faith and has a passion to share the hope that he has in Christ. So as we come to this part of the message this morning that I would call the application, I want to ask you this question. We've seen here that it talks about the gospel affecting them, how it drastically changed your life and how it moved them and led them to live a life that was obedient in servitude to God. But what does this have to do with you today? What does this have to do with you today as a student at Heritage Christian School, whether you're a senior or you're a seventh grader? What does it have to do with you today? See, no doubt many of you, you're on different levels, so to speak, spiritually. No doubt many of you, and I have no doubt about this, that many of you, there has been a point in your life when you've understand your need of a Savior and you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you've accepted Him and you have that assurance of salvation. But beyond that, you live a life that is demonstrative of the fact that you desire to live for God and to serve Him. And that is no doubt the evidence of the fact that you are a Christian. But I believe it's a safe assumption this morning that that's not the case with each and every one of you. And there very well could be one of you or several of you or half a dozen of you or even more this morning that you know you sat through chapel session after chapel service after chapel service and maybe you've been here for six years and maybe you're a senior about to graduate from high school and you sat through scores and perhaps hundreds of chapel sessions and you've heard the gospel message over and over and over again but you never have allowed it to change your life. You believe it as, yeah, I believe God's there. But you've never believed it personally. You've never accepted it personally to allow it to change your life. See, the power of the gospel is this, is that is what God desires to produce in your heart and life, exactly what he produced in the hearts and lives of the believers there in Thessalonica. It drastically changed them and moved them to want to live and serve God. But I can't help but think this morning that if someone claims to be a Christian yet has absolutely no desire or, or moving within them or anything within them that says, I want to live for God and serve God, I can't help but ask the question, 
Are you really even saved? If there's no desire in your heart, even just an inkling of, hey, listen, I ought to want to live for God. then I think you really ought to be asking yourself this question. Am I really saved? See, because the power of the gospel does this, is it, it transforms your life and it puts within this desire within your heart that I want to live for God. I understand I make mistakes and I understand that my flesh, it causes me to sin at times, but ultimately I want to live for God. That's what the power of the gospel produces in the life, of, in the heart of an individual when they truly respond to the gospel. But for those of you this morning that you know for sure that you've responded to the gospel and you have that evidence, the evidence in your heart and life and you have that desire to live for God. I brought this morning a, a simple illustration and I know probably some of you thought, well, Brother James has a, uh, a cold and he's going to be blowing his nose in front of us. No, that's not why I brought tissue boxes up here this, this morning. But for the sake of an illustration this morning, as I said, the power of the gospel is this, is that we are given power. Not so that we can force people into specific mode or, or, or mold or force people to live and abide according to a specific set of standards that we have for them. But as I, as I previously stated that, really the power of the gospel or the, the direction of the gospel is this, is that as a preacher of the gospel, my, my goal ought to be not to get people to conform to a specific look or image, but it's to get them to that so that they prioritize in their life that they live the way God would have them to live. Nothing more, nothing less. You live the way you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are living the way God would have you to live. That's the whole point of it. And what I'm saying to you this morning is this. As you're a student here at Heritage Christian School, and no doubt you've sat through class period after class period after class period. You've had Bible class every single day for the last however many years as a result of being a student at Heritage Christian School. Can I tell you, you know what those, the teachers are doing? What the teachers are doing is this, is they're, they're, they're taking and what they're doing, they're investing time into your life and they're giving you certain portions of, of gospel truths that you can take and then you can bury it in your heart and bury it in your life. And the point is to build you up so that you have the necessary tools so that you know how to be in tune with God and so that you can live a life that is led by God. Live a life serving God. And so that every single class period that you sit through and every single chapel session that you sit through, that the, the speakers, they're putting something, they're investing something into your life and they're putting into the, your box, your life. But as I said, the point and the purpose of it is not to force you into a box and to say you have to stay within the confines of this box. Your teachers, they love you. They no doubt, many of them, and I hope all of them, that they spend time on a regular basis praying for you by name. Why? Because they're investing in you. They desire for God to have free reign in your life and for you to be in tune with God, for you to purpose in your heart that you're going to live for God. So year after year, they put in to your life. How many of you here this morning would say that this would be true of you, that you, every single year that you've been in school, you've gone to Heritage? Does anyone hear it at all like that? Several of you. Every single year from the moment you were in kindergarten until now, you've gone to Heritage. I want you to think about that for a second. How many Bible classes, how many chapel sessions have you sat through where your teachers where preachers have come, sometimes they've driven two and three hours to come here to preach in chapel, and I can assure you it's not for the money. But why do they do that? They do it because they're investing your life. They're putting in to your life, and there's a purpose and there's a reason for that. Sometimes we can look at it and say, well, they're just saying all these things to get me to align with a specific standard so that 
they'll just be happy with the way I live. And some of you, you may go through high school and, and you're maybe on the verge of graduating here just a few months. And, and you say, you know what, I, I, I'm fed up with this. I've been fed up with just living in a box. And I'm tired of people just putting into me. I want to do my own thing. And you may look at the teachers and, and all the investment that they're doing into you and all this thing, the teaching and instruction, you begin to rebel against it and push against it. I don't want anything to do with that. And all those things that were put into your life, they're just there. And unfortunately, there's been many graduates of Heritage Christian School, people even that I went to school with. They, they wouldn't even darken the doors of a church today. Because they begin to look at the stuff that was put into them, invested in them, and they begin to resent it. You know what? If you were to take a bank account, and some of you, I know you've gone through different financial classes. I think Brother Ron still teaches a financial class, right? First, no? Mrs. Beck. You know, the point of saving money, what is the point of it? The point of accumulating money building a net worth, building value in a bank account, what is the point of it? It's because one day you're going to make a withdrawal out of it. One day, it's, it's not so that you can accumulate a whole bunch of, of money and by the time you die, you have several million dollars sitting in a bank account just so that you can leave it to your kids and you'll live dirt poor for the rest of your life. Is that really why you accumulate wealth? No. It's so that you set aside money now so that one day you can live like no one else. It's so that one day you can make withdrawals. What I'm telling you this morning is this, is you as a student at Heritage Christian School, your teachers, they put into you over and over and over and over again. And it's not just for you to sit there and do absolutely nothing with it. It's not so that you could just sit there, graduate from Heritage Christian School, go on to college and have a family, and, then, and just sit there and do absolutely nothing with it. But the point of this, the point of the gospel message and gospel truths being deposited into a heart is this. So that one day we are equipped to then go forward and take the gospel to others. So that one day as you graduate from Heritage Christian School or even before then, that as you interact with people that have never heard the gospel message, that you can take out some of those investments that the teachers have made in your life and you can withdraw from the box and say, listen, hey, let me share with you a little bit of truth of what I learned in school today about the gospel message, how Jesus loves you. The point of it is this for you to then take out what's been invested in you and to give it and pass it on. Not so you can hold. See, we see this example about this church here in Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul put in. And when he was removed, they withdrew. See, the point of the power that the Apostle Paul had was to move them onto God's agenda. It was so that as he was removed, they had the necessary tools to then carry the gospel See, as a student of Heritage Christian School, there's been a lot of deposits that have been made into your life. And sooner or later, there's going to be placed upon you a great responsibility upon your life that you begin to then, not only you may continue to have deposits made into your life because the more you continue to learn, the more you understand and grow in the knowledge and understanding of God that there's deposits that are being made into your life. But the point of those deposits is so that you can pull them out and that you can give them and you can share them forward so that God can use your life the way he sees fit so you can live for him. Not so that you can live to yourself. Because can I tell you, there's way too many Christians. They receive deposits week in and week out. They go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Yet the moment they darken those doors, they walk out the back doors, they shut their box and say, nope, this is all mine. I'm not doing anything with it. What I'm saying to you this morning is this, is the gospel is given to you. The investment is being made and put in your life 
for you to make withdrawals, for you to carry forward, for you to go and give it to someone else. And as they say, pay it forward. You know, we like the feel good thing about paying it forward when you sit in the Starbucks line, right? Someone paid for your drink. Well, I'll just pay for the person behind me. Why don't we view the gospel that way? The gospel's been given to us. The investment has been made in our life. Why aren't we making the withdrawals? Another application I'd make this morning would be this. There may be some of you in a very near future, you may be in a leadership position. And even there's some teachers perhaps here in this, in this auditorium this morning that you may be sitting here and thinking, listen, there are times that as you teach, I know it's just downright discouraging and difficult and challenging. And it seems like no matter what you do, they don't get it. And I understand that. But can I challenge you? Don't lose sight of this truth. That the reason why you do what you do is not to force the kids to align to a specific mold but it's to make deposits into their life so that one day when they graduate and you're no longer in a position of authority over them, that they don't look back and say, well, they were just trying to force me to align with something. But then they could truly look at that box that they have, that box that, they're, that is their life. And they can look at that box and say, you know what? I'm going through this difficulty this has been a really challenging time for me in my life. And I remember that one truth that that teacher taught me. That I can rely on God. That God's always there with me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that the stuff that you put into the lives of these students. You may or may not see it. But one day very well they could reach a point when they begin to glean and pull out the deposits that you make. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So students, my challenge to you this morning is this. You've been given much. Seniors, you've been given much. Your box, by the time you graduate from Heritage Christian School, it's probably pretty full. I'm not saying more can't fit in there, but it's probably pretty full. But I believe now is the responsibility that has been placed upon your shoulder as a Christian, as a follower of God, as one that has a desire to serve God. It's now time that you start withdrawing those deposits. And you begin to take those and you begin to put them and invest them in the lives of other people that you see that God brings your way. See, the point of leadership is this, is to put other people onto God's agenda. Not to your own. Not to force them into the spirit of obedience. I have to do this. No, it's to say, listen, I believe God. I believe that the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as someone has called upon Christ and they are truly a Christian, I believe that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can direct them and guide them to live the way they ought to live. And so therefore, I'm going to make deposits into their lives to instruct them, to teach them. So that one day, they can make withdrawals also. And they can carry forth the gospel. That's what this church did. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul did here in this passage. He made the deposits so that when he was removed, they can make the withdrawals. They knew how to live. I challenge you students. Would you allow the teachers through the power of the Holy Spirit, would you allow them to make the deposits into your life so that when you leave this place, you'll have the withdrawals to make so that God can use you in powerful ways? I never imagined, and when I was in high school, I never imagined that I'd be a preacher. Honestly, I couldn't stand being up in front of people. I get really nervous when I'm up in front of people. It's not something that I really wanted to. I remember my senior year when I was just about two months away from graduating. We had spiritual emphasis week. Brother Dwight Smith stood right here and he preached. I remember that day when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, James, I want you to preach. And 
And I remember going forward and surrendering and saying, God, I'll do it if this is what you want me to do. I'm not comfortable with this. I, I don't know if I can do this, but God, if this is really what you're calling me to do, I'll do it. I tell you, God has used me in ways that I never even thought possible. But what it took was people putting into my heart, people putting into my life. Pastor Kevin Folger, John Plum, and many other people that put into my life so that one day then I could begin to make the withdrawals and that God could use me in the way he saw fit. Can I challenge you in that way? Would you allow the deposits to be made into your life and then when the time is right, would you then make the withdrawals to carry forth the gospel? Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. In just a moment, I'm going to pray.